Hey, hey, hey there, Taoists. Welcome to episode two of Dowing Impactful Conversations. In this episode, I spoke to Pete, the founder and chief summoner of Metagame that just had their 1.0 launch. We talked about raising capital in a more balanced way. Is being the clout leader mean you're also a benevolent dictator? And then we had some joke Dow submissions by our wonderful Fid, Crypto Co, and Da Badger. Thank you guys for your submissions. Make sure if you want to participate in our next contest and have your questions featured on one of these episodes, make sure to follow me on Twitter at Alcolmist to participate in our next contest. And so without further ado, here is episode two. How was your December, man? Good. I took some time off and then I worked anyway. And then I still dowed stuff. <laughs> Could not stop the dowing. Well, Peeth, you're the founder. You're the chief initiator. How would you describe how you started Metagame or what your role is? Benevolent dictator, as some people in Discord call you lovingly. I like to just go with the summoner. The summoner. And that's, that's summoning in both the code sense, like you're summoning from the ether, these alchemical symbols communicating to the magical machines. But then also with your writing and your podcasting, you're kind of creating this summoning circle and people just keep pouring into metagame, but not necessarily sticking around or not necessarily the right ones, but we love them all, don't we? We do, we do. Okay, I do only the letter, so I write the human code and then the other humans write the computer code. Mm, yeah, so you're like the recruiter, the summoner. Pretty much, yeah. Metagame is a multiplayer online coordination game, and you've been kind of in the space for a while, a real OG. How would you say Metagame can increase its impact? Or how can it begin to develop those ways of meta impacting? More impact. I think for more impact, we just need more money because after all these years, we like built up the initial version of the platform. We have the community. And so we just need to start spending more and more money so the like the whole thing moves a lot faster because yeah, right now, everybody's just like treating it as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And then it just slow, but we saw that like when you put up bounties that are actually paid bounties, then people just come onto it. And then like questions posted some questions with 0 0.5 medic and they got their discord swarm to one and a half thousand people in 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just, you know, 50 cents. Yeah. But people were jumping and clamoring over each other to do those, weren't they? Right. Yeah. It, it was a pride, but like how little. It was required to do that. To like activate people. Right. And like the people that come for that might not be the best people, but if you get like thousands of people every week, then you only need a few of them to convert and be proper contributors. Yeah. Yeah. Only only a small percentage needs to, to really stick around. But as long as you're moving high volume, you will be doing pretty good, won't you? Right. Yeah. Metagame, it's been going on for how long? Three years? Yeah. And how many contributors would you say there's been as a whole? As a whole, a lot. Well, that, yeah, a lot. But the ones that have kind of been consistent and stuck it out to this day. There's very few who like who were here from the beginning up until this day. So like a lot of the people change. So people come, then work for a few months, then find an actual job or they found a better paying role or just like grow out of this role and find another role. So that's completely fine in case of Metagame because we are like trying to be this onboarding place. People come here, they learn the basics. This is like their first DAO that they participate in and then they move on. Mm -hmm. And right now I think we have like 20-ish active contributors. Hmm. And that's all on content and code development. Yeah, yeah. Content, code development, community stuff. Community relations, yeah. Well, then the onboarding place, not a lot of people stick around. And that 
kind of goes with the territory is what I'm hearing you saying right because you are the very nature of being the onboarding educative resource is that you know like school you're gonna grow out of it you're gonna learn what you think you need to know and everything you need and then hopefully move on so money you know capital would be most impactful to metagame right now what are the kind of ways you see metagame in the future or in the very near term and then far-flung future how do you raise more of that money to maximize more of that impact how do you raise more money what are your ways we are going to start raising in about a month so it, there's a bunch of things that we need to wrap up to prepare for the fundraise yeah right now we're mostly working on the white paper finishing that but then there's bugs to fix on the platform side there's content to be produced so there's yeah a lot of different things but i think yeah like finally explaining it properly in a white paper and showing all the progress that we had so far along with the proofs of what we could actually do if we had some funding finally had some funding mm -hmm. and i think it shouldn't be a problem because yeah we've been around for three years we did a lot of different stuff and we kind of proven ourselves that like we are gonna be here no matter what and that we are here for the right reasons we're not here to get some easy money because otherwise you would have been getting easy money. You would have been fundraised <laughs> three years ago. <laughs> so what are kind of, I know there's Gitcoin grants. What are some of the ways you guys have gotten funding so far these past three years? Uh, we got a grant from Meta Cartel, and then the second one was through Gitcoin. And those were really like the main sources that we had. So we had 5K from Meta Cartel and like 10K from Gitcoin. And then other than that, like there was no official raising of money. There's just, there's the patients, there's just the people who find the project and become patrons. And then after some time, like after two years, pretty much. So only like we need the last year, we did the first like actual fundraise mm -hmm. and uh, uh, proper fund, like an actual uh, VC fundraise and like a legal entity and doing all the paperwork and all that sort of stuff. But it was more like friends and family around our crypto native friends. Just, mm -hmm. uh, we use the eater. Right. The angel seed. Not even angel, but mostly just like friends of the project. And uh, we mm -hmm. use the eater by DAO. So that allows people to create a fundraising campaign that mm turns the, the funds raised basically into a DAO. So we raised some money and created the seed fund DAO. And then what we started doing was that like once a month, we submitted uh, our monthly progress report as the funds from the seed fund into metagame. So mm. this sort of a dual DAO structure. And what was the technicals on where those funds were held? multi-sig what kind of application right on dow house native yeah on dow house then yeah the people who joined the fundraise could also just like rage quit their funds at any point if they see that we are not delivering progress or they can just not vote on our proposals and what was the governance for that treasury i guess one of one or proportional i guess tokenomically yeah proportional to how much money people put in that's mm -hmm. how much what they got so how much would you say that raising that way impacted you, I guess? How much stress was it, would you say, from what you know about VC and Silicon Valley? Is it better in Web3? Are you optimistic about the future? Are you a little bit cynical? Uh, hard to tell because the whole fundraise was happening at the worst possible time. Like, crypto itself was uh, taking a nosedive. Uh, Russia had invaded Ukraine like a week before. People were at Eat Denver. So there's like all of these things happening all at once. And uh, yeah, it just was pretty terrible timing overall. The perfect storm. And uh, yeah, like if we did at the big bull market, then maybe we would have raised a lot more. And then I could say that okay, Web3 fundraising can replace the VC funding. But the way it went down, I think we might actually need some proper VC funding. Hmm. And what have you guys been playing around with cap table wise with that? I think that like actual investors, then we might have to promise like a specific percentage of total tokens because like the way Metagame right. currently works, we can't do that because first of all, Metagame itself is not selling any tokens the metagame is only distributing tokens and then the workers can either sell or not sell but if you want like actual vc money then people will want like a specific number of like what the 
amount of the token supply that they will get and yeah something like that we'll have to work it out but i'm yeah, slowly making my peace with it and writing a post and i will submit a proposal <laughs> and see what the rest of metagame thinks about it yeah Ooh. we'll see how that goes speaking of talking to metagame what's been the biggest point of contention or conflict so far leading up to seasoning nine mm, i wouldn't say any single thing actually maybe like a theme like governance or you know tokenomics stuff like that oh like for me personally the main problem has always been like how metagame is a fairly vague idea and we use source script so people can just do whatever. And then uh, we just had a general lack of focus because yeah, the, the idea is vague and you can get paid by doing whatever. So we had like, especially in the bull run, we had people coming in and just doing uh, a random stuff, like random pieces that don't actually contribute to the roadmap. And then yeah, they get the project doesn't actually move forward much. Kind of takes away priority funding from the things that need to come before the other things. Cause yeah, I get it. And right. Yeah. The, like the resources are very constrained, but there was no way to like align people on a, mm -hmm. or like not align, but like, yeah. There, like you can't force people in the case of the now. Yeah, you couldn't enforce the roadmap on people and say, hey, right. you're too yeah, far ahead or that's roadmap. irrelevant because it's still, it was relevant because metagames are very vaguely defined. Right. Yeah. And then like, as you mentioned before, like some people who lovingly called me the benevolent dictator was because <laughs> I was just trying to get people to follow the roadmap and like, mm -hmm. I don't have any like formal authority. But given I've been here for three years, then people, they take that as, you know, oh, the, the word of God, the word of right. Pete. Yeah. And some people had a problem with that. Like, even though there's no like formal authority, like there's no, like I can't actually tell people what to do or not to do. There were still people who would listen to me, what I say. And then other people saying, oh, but that's centralized because you're, you have influence. But yeah, like the influence is not like, there's no formal authority so like how can i be a dictator if i, I can't you, dictate anything i i just got clout man but yeah that, but that's the whole uh, this balance of like on the one side you have these people who are like kind of down maximalists and they see like any sort of influence or authority or hierarchy or anything those dang anarchists yeah and i'm an anarchist like personally but i'm just yeah. not a like decentralization maximalist because like you can't have a maximum decentralized every piece of stack well not everyone is as capable so why would you decentralize to add infinitum you know there would be right. way to like you said with the funding problem there was just a lack of prioritizing in the right order that things got diluted and now what you're left with three years later is a little bit less progress than you had wished you had made but yeah so like it's already like maybe too decentralized in that like we are i don't know if, if like what other DAO is that out there that is actually voting democratically like i don't know any other DAO that's like one person one vote actually yeah i and so, like sure. how do you go more decentralized than that like i know anybody like has everybody regardless of how much they contribute or how competent they are they still have the same voice it's just that some people listen to my voice more than other people's voices even though like i have still have only one vote like mm. okay so should i kill myself or what the fuck they want me to do do i need to decentralize myself y'all need like 12 <laughs> different peats or representations of peat right but so that, that's like in balance of like on the one side people are like oh it's not decentralized enough like this is still centralized and then you decide you have like the lack of focus and like the stress about like trying to get people to focus on like the things that actually move the project forward and it's yeah a hard balance to find it, it sounds like have you read dawn of everything by david graber and wingro i'm like 30 percent in 30 percent. so you got through some of the first part it sounds a lot like that native anarchism where the chiefs don't have formal authority right they lead at the pleasure of their people and it's just whatever the chief says if it pleases their ears they'll do it if it doesn't they'll just not that nothing's gonna happen you're right yeah it just reminds me a lot of that and how these DAOs really do feel like that classless no hierarchy you know 
economic place now and yet people are still finding more things to contest with like oh no it's not decentralized enough it's not flat enough of a hierarchy and guys that can happen over time but you just can't rush it or enforce it i think you have to do some coming together and some centralizing under some form of leadership vision values whatever it is you want to make that chief that north star you guys have to be moving more in unison otherwise i think you dilute the project too much and nothing gets done right yeah i was reading this great post that was about i don't know what the title was but it was talking about the difference between the mission and the village and how there's this always like in communities there's this tension between people who want to get shit done versus people who just want to have the community because like the community wants to take care of all the people like have everything be completely egalitarian like have no pressure have no hierarchy have no like it's like it's, it's super dull like but then on the mission side we have people who are like yeah but if we keep doing this then we'll never achieve what we want to achieve so like let's organize let's move things forward let's focus and yeah there's this intention unless it's like very clear that like okay we are either a community or we are a project but when you're a community project then there's always this tension yeah yeah it's hard to gosh get those people motivated and get them really activated in a manner that's ordered enough that no one gets hurt there's no conflict right because that's always that tension so what would you say of the house of dows that currently exists within metagame who do you think's creating the most impact who am I think is creating the most impact in meta game? Because you have all the House of DAOs and you're onboarding, and those are going to be the DAOs moving forward with meta game, and they're kind of as the first ones in the House of DAOs in the guild. They're going to be kind of that beacon. So I'm curious which ones you're impartial to. I don't know. We haven't actually like in terms of the guilds that we are onboarding, we haven't seen much activities from from most, if any, of those guilds. Like they have the profile page created but there was not really anything else for them to do like because the platform was really more so for individuals than for mm -hmm. other DAOs so like yeah they create a page and there's not like that there wasn't up until fairly recently anything else that they can do really so only now like less than a month ago we started reaching out to all of these DAOs again and now that we have like the playbooks and the pets so they can they create these onboarding pets from metagame into their DAO and stuff so which ones do you want people going into? Which ones do you think they should be onboarding? I know you got to do the impartial <laughs> thing and not say anyone, but I know you have to know more about some than others and you got to have a little bit of your own opinion, right? My favorites will always be like Dow House, Bloom Network, or Give It. Give It, yeah, those are some good ones. So I know there's metagame conference in croatia coming up what's the date on that oh yeah it's a uh, 16th to 18th so three days of the of the actual main event at the venue which is this 200 years old uh, fortress mm -hmm. which is a pretty epic location and then we have like five days of warm-up leading up to the event where there will be random activities like you know the stuff that's usually happening around conferences like meetups but also just like fun activities like going to the adrenaline park or the water park or quad biking or paintballing or whatever else and then after metafest there will be a week-long bus trip down the coast of croatia to dubrovnik so yeah the whole thing will be like 10 days 12 days something like that with yeah three days being the actual main event but yeah overall it should be pretty epic you said the 15th to the 18th 16th a 16th yeah and that's February? That's this month? Oh, no, no, no. That's August. So way August. out in the summer. Yeah, way out in the summer. Okay. Will there be any kind of metagame questing Can, since it's a castle? Is there like a little bit of a little bit of role play of doing some IRL coordination? So we have one guy called Peko, who's like a game theorist who organized like 50 person LARP. And so he's coming that something will happen like we have some we discussed a bit about like uh, in what ways we could gamify the event or like what kinds of like games we could have but yeah we haven't gotten too deep into that part because we're still booking like the main speakers and uh, getting sponsors 
mm. who's in talks for that who you want and who aligns the most with this kind of festival so we were mainly like the main team is DAOs and regions mm-hmm. so like really any Taoist or region is welcome to join to attend or to apply to speak and then besides that we're also trying to get some of the more like meta people from outside of crypto like a sort of game B or meta modernist space and uh, yeah get some other camps besides the crypto people right so speaking of some meta modernism you had your most recent post meta game in meta modernism part one where you broke down some of what previous modernism was how postmodernism came into play in our very recent history and proposing meta modernism why don't you give a quick little recap maybe of your definition of meta modernism and kind of how it applies to meta game and what kind of impact that has on your philosophy and how the dao works operates because i know we've talked about your one person one vote little bit hesitant about bringing on VCs and I think that all relates right so yeah meta modernism is kind of trying to take the best of modernism and postmodernism and so those are kind of like the philosophies well modernism I don't know what what age I guess would be like the the starting point I mean there is no like specific starting mm-hmm. point but like the age of modernism was marked like uh, by like top-down planning, rationality, like the the individual, the market, and uh, capitalist system, and all that sort of stuff. And then, as like this modern society was st- starting to show like the signs of aging, or like it stopped being so awesome because like there was stuff that was going wrong with modernism as well. And then came the time of postmodernism, which was like a time of criticism, and there was like. Yeah, like you can see a lot of that around the world now, especially like in uh, academic circles, you know, people being like really critical of the whole system of capitalism itself. Or like it's really a deconstructionist movement about like pointing out everything that's wrong with like the modern society, like anything from the state system and capitalism down to like the way families are structured and all that sort of stuff. So it's really like super critical and constructionist movement. And then metamodernism is trying to bring it like both together. So like taking the best from modernism, but combining it with this critical eye of like doing proper uh, analysis of postmodernism and then like using that to construct like a synthesis of the best possible ways that societies could look like or like the best possible worldviews. Because like postmodernism was also like very skeptical of any grand narratives and it was just like oh it's all like everything is 100% subjective and it's all like social coding and I don't know so metamodernism is bringing a bit to back of that bigger picture but still staying critical of itself kind of trying to constantly criticize itself deconstruct and reconstruct in a way that you know makes it stronger bigger more whole altogether right yeah, because uh, like modernism was really like, it didn't question itself. It was all about like, you know, it's all like super scientific and top down planned. And yeah, then we realized that you can't really plan and predict and measure everything. Well, people were making interpretations, right? And applications of data that once you have enough time and hindsight, you realize how incomplete your interpretation was, how, you know, naive or narrow focused the scope of you know study is and that's kind of all the postmodern critique but then meta modern critique is is trying to say all right there's that criticism is valid but now you have to replace you have to fix what you're criticizing right you have to actually do something you cannot just criticize you have to replace the brick you just took out of the wall right thing right well i almost forgot that i did a joke dow contest for this podcast so we got some of those questions i had three submissions have you checked out joke dow before i've checked it out but i've never used it yeah so it was pretty fun it was an interesting way i think of getting i think it's better than a youtuber saying oh you know comment down below what you think i should do for the next video right i don't think youtube likes are gonna make 
the best ideas surface to the top. I think a community that builds itself over time and has different varying amounts of reputation and kind of levels within it based on how much involvement there is, is where this governance is going. And JokeDAO is pretty neat for doing that. You can airdrop the tokens and if they've got Otter space badges, I'm sure we can have quest chains integrated, right? So if you've done a certain amount of quests, that seems a lot more interesting to me. But for this proposal, it was me, a billionaire in impact tokens, distributing my vote because I did not, I think, prepare the contest enough. But anyway, get into some of those questions. Vid, he's in metagame. And then CryptoCo.Lens, he's also in metagame. So yeah, two metagamers giving me proposals. You should be proud. <laughs> nice. And the Badger almost forgot about you, but I'm here in post and did not forget about you. You was kind for submitting your proposal. Thank you. So Vid asked, what lessons can we learn from the successes and failures of past app? What lessons do we learn? So one that I've been going around with, you know, like if you're starting a DAO, don't call it a DAO. Like don't have yeah. DAO in your link. <laughs> Don't have DAO in your description. Like it stopped being kind of a counter signal. Yep. The same way that the early crypto projects all had coin in the name. Now it's time to get rid of the DAO. And there's also a better reason. Like it's not just that it like not necessary to have the DAO in the name, but also that you might be attracting the wrong kind of people. Like the people who yeah. prefer decentralization over like functional organizing. Mm. And lack of accountability, probably. Right. Yeah, you attract people like that was really like a safe haven for people who don't like responsibilities, mm. like, have commitment issues. And so you just attract those kind of people. So do not call yourself a DAO if you're starting a DAO. What's some of your favorite terms instead of a DAO? Digital community? No, it's just that it doesn't matter. Like you call the project what it's called like the name itself and you write in the description what you want to achieve so it's like mm -hmm. the organizing type doesn't matter like it's the mission like what you what are you trying to do like maybe you're trying to build a community then you write okay i'm building a community for this and maybe you want to like solve some specific problem you write that like you don't have to write we, this is a DAO for doing this or like we are a DAO community yeah, because of what it signals this day and age, given how much the well has been poisoned with those terms, crypto, NFT, DAO, blockchain, all of them. Right. And there isn't like a place for NFTs. There's a clear definition of what is an NFT, but that's true. With DAOs, there's no like one definition. You could be calling yourself anything, a platform co-op, a online monarchy, who knows? <laughs> right. How can we ensure that DAOs are designed to be inclusive and responsive? How do we ensure that DAOs are inclusive? And what was the other part? And responsive. Maybe we need an AI chatbot. <laughs> Maybe. That's a good question. Like, I, I would start with, like, asking how inclusive does your DAO have to be? Because it depends on what you want to achieve. Again, you might not want to be maximally inclusive. Maybe you want to do something very specific that requires very highly skilled people. And then if, you, if you're you super inclusive and you invite everybody, then you're not going to get the right people. So like there's this uh, assumption that's kind of a postmodern assumption that like, mm. oh, if we just increase inclusion and the diversity, mm. then that will solve all the problems. Yep. But actually like you need people who are interested in this specific thing and you need people who have skills. If you're just super inclusive and super diverse, like if you're, oh, we need one black person in the team. No, you don't need one black person in a team of this yeah. specific skill set. Like if that person happens to be black, white, yellow, like doesn't matter. Like who gives a fuck like what color the person's skin is <laughs> or what sex, like what gender somebody is. Like. I think it matters more what their lived experience is in relation to everyone else in your team, right? If you're a bunch of white dudes that grew up in America, in New York, I think you guys have just like a different, narrower perspective than someone who grew up in Latin America, right? And in the third world or something, I think that kind right. of diversity is real. And in that case, you're looking for like uh, cultural right. diversity. So you're looking for somebody from a different culture. You're not looking 
for somebody with between skin color. And I think that's what people mean when they say, oh, I want this kind of diversity. You mean cultural diversity, but you're not actually hitting the metric of cultural diversity because the reality is there's plenty of black dudes that grew up in just a white and bougie right. of neighborhood as I did and right. have the exact same perspective on the world. They went to nicer right. private schools than me. So it shouldn't be your only qualifier, right? You should look into the person. Same. And then same. like, what is yeah. that is saying to these people? Yeah, like, I'm sorry, but I don't see people in genders and skin color. I'm like looking for people of a different perspectives or different skill set, whatever, like just doesn't matter to me like what they are on the technical level i guess mm -hmm. i don't know what else to call it on the on the genetic level no that is that is not our focus here we're interested in your metaphysical mind but that said like you do need to be welcoming people in your community like people joining discord welcome them on discord ask them what they're like how they find your project why they find it interesting like what they are working on or you're just asking people questions i think people like being asked questions and make them feel included like attention is giving to them and i think we can be a little inclusive by kind of doing region specific kind of scholarships and sponsorships because if you're not careful and you develop metagame throughout these years and you're only pursuing the people that are you know rich enough or capable enough now then you're never going to get that diversity of people that have lived in other places so i think that's probably your best bet is go, hey, we're looking for people in Latin America. We're looking for people in, you know, Africa, in India, in China. We're not looking for your whatever color it is. We just want to prove that you're there and that you have a lot of experience there. And we want to include you. Why? Because we want to include India in metagame. And you're going to be the person more qualified in onboarding and educating other people of the same background right yeah yeah you just name it like specific economic strata or mm, like mm. specific cultures i think that's a that's a valid strategy yep so what measures can be taken to ensure that individuals with power in the dow do not exert it unequally that they don't exert it how unequally so i think what we were talking earlier about it, people calling you a benevolent dictator right so what are kind of the technical tools, maybe talk about Dow House, where someone can't exert themselves unequally, I guess, what could be those powers that they're talking about, though? Because I can think easily about financial powers you don't want exerted unequally. But like the problem we were talking about earlier with your clout, your reputation within the Dow, within metagame, just kind of outshines, you know, overshadows other people but that's no intention of your own that's just a natural thing that happens with you exercising your autonomy in the DAO and doing it a lot more and a lot more effectively than everyone else I'm curious say so maybe the most important thing is to have the right people in the right places and to make sure that it stays so so like I think that's a good preventive measure. Like if you have the people that like the person needs a certain power, like in our case, we just introduce it so that like the champion of community has the power to kick somebody from the server if they do something bad. And then he has to take a screenshot of what happened and post it in a different channel and write, hey, I kicked this person for this reason. And then he can have this autonomy. We can like entrust him with this power. But then if we don't like how he's using that power or if it turns out he's abusing it, we can just vote him out. Yeah, but there's this record of accountability, right? The one layer that is appropriate because he's exercising his autonomy, kicking people out, right? But going that extra step to report back what his actions were to the rest of the people, there's that level of accountability within the governance that says, hey, you've been kicking a lot of people out arbitrarily or we're noticing a theme or a pattern in the way that you're operating things. That's not cool. Whereas I think if you just let someone go rampant, right, and with no accountability, no record, then who's to know and when someone going to speak up or how are they going to speak up when that person is, you know, exerting themselves in an unequal manner. Right. Yeah. Transparency in backstops this like 
super important. But yeah, more than anything, I think it's uh, like having the right people. So like building trust and knowing that like when somebody is in this right position, that it's the right person. That, like he may have power, but it's like they're not going to abuse it because you know them. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, having a backstop that like there's transparency. And if they do abuse it, then you can just get rid of the person. Well, it's interesting to have a community backstop, right? Because in the traditional corporate world, if you were a community manager and you were doing the same thing, exerting your power unequally, well, what's going to stop you? It's going to be someone higher up in the hierarchy than you that's going to discover or get it reported, whatever it is. And then it's going to take them acting. But when it's in the format you're talking in kind of a more anarcho syndicalist one where everyone's kind of accountable to everyone else within this community it's just really interesting for metagame to be operating that way in this space right yeah anybody can, like bottom up really so anybody can just say okay this is not right let's vote this person out whereas you see we didn't have that and yeah, that's like one of the criticism that some people brought up is like, oh, but if we give the community champion this role, like this power, then it's the same like on Reddit or like other platforms where it's not decentralized because some people are moderators and they have the power. Yes, yeah. but in our case, any member of the community can start a vote to revoke that power. Whereas right. like on all the other platforms, you never had that ability. And there's there was no transparency. I couldn't go to the Reddit mods records of his bands, of his actions and go, all right, he did this to me. I wonder how he's treated other people. There's no amount of that transparency. Right, it's yeah. a, like a key difference, like, super different. All right, next question. What strategies can be implemented to ensure that everyone's voice is heard and valued in the DAO? That kind of feels like the inclusive and responsive, but kind of like flipped around. Uh, I guess just open proposals, like yeah. having posts where anybody can comment. Like I think time zone can be a big uh, challenge here. Like if you only discuss things on calls, then the people who like either in a different time zone or have another overlapping call or something, then those feel those people can feel excluded because they can't really participate in decision making so i think it's super important to have like async discussions and just like having forum threads or uh, discord threads where different proposals are being discussed and also like channels where any member of community can bring up problems or whatever and then yeah, their voice can be heard either, either in the existing proposals or they can just like point out the problems or start their own proposals so like yeah having those options yeah that asynchronous communication i think is what really makes metagame so meta right i think that's great for the people that are trying to onboard others into web3 but it really feels like it's going to become the standard of work that founders, that boards, and that DAOs in general will be recording a podcast, having a sub stack, having weekly Discord calls, all these kind of standards that make this asynchronous communication and conflict resolution really possible. Right, yeah, newsletters are kind of also underappreciated in the space and i think mm. it's so critical like to keep the community actually like in the loop because most people are not gonna be coming back to discord like i don't know like about everybody else but i don't know in my case there's i'm a member of 100 different uh, discord servers but i only visit yeah. the one or two of them regularly i'm and looking at like 190 discord servers on my tabs right now and yeah i can tell I visit five to 10, maybe. <laughs> right. But everybody looks at their email. And so you're not going to get everybody to check the channels and like see the announcements or whatever. But they're probably going to see your email if you like send them a monthly a newsletter or something. I think yeah, that's really yeah, what I would recommend to any projects getting started. So have their own newsletter. And then it's also like you keep the people in the loop who are not going to be active in the community, which is on the discord which is most people and you also have this uh, like list of people who are interested so you have your own audience that can be exported to other platforms it's not just the ownership of discord because you actually have a direct line of communication to any of your to any of the people who are interested in the project yeah staying multi-platform and kind of pluralistic with your communications is key 
you said everyone checks their email and I wonder if it's a generational thing or just a me thing. I never check my email. As soon, like 10 years ago, as soon as I was getting barraged by too much spam and I had to like <laughs> manage my inbox, I said, screw this thing. I'm going to use you to verify and like <laughs> sign up for things, but that's about it. You know, I, but I do check that Substack all the time. You don't check your email? You open Substack like specifically? I do. I guess I'm a little weird like that. And I like will specifically search out metagame and go, oh, I wonder if there's been any new posts. Like I do not get the emails for it. That's funny. Yeah, I think that's uh, one of the things that I want on the metagame dashboard. Like this ability for people to just plug in different newsletters or different RSS feeds. And that also like can, can have people be less dependent on checking email because yeah, I'm not checking email for any communications, but I get tagged either like updates from the forums or GitHub or all the newsletters that I'm subscribed to. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And the ENS domain is kind of becoming the new email address in a lot of ways. And I think that'll kind of be your connection to all these DAOs and all these DAOs will ping you for work. and. How do you discover that work, manage what you want to do? Well, you should coordinate it using Meta OS, right? Right. But yeah, there, right now there's no no specific way. I think there's a few projects who offer this kind of uh, message Ethereum addresses, but there's no yeah, there's no one that's like really adopted. And yeah, in Meta game we want to have it so that this dashboard is just automatically pulling in whatever is attached to your address. So it can be your email or it can be your just a bounties across different bounties platforms, like Wanderverse or DWORK, or it could be DAOs, the proposals from the DAOs that you're a member of or anything like that. All right, well, last question from Vid. How can we ensure that decision-making in the DAO is based on fairness and equality? How can we ensure that decision-making is based on fairness and equality? I guess it, a lot of it depends on just what voting system you're using. Like if you just have pure token voting, then you can never do that. It's going to be very plutocratic with that. Right. It always ends up plutocratic because people can just buy tokens and yeah, <laughs> you just can't do it that way. But yeah, do it in something like metagame where it's one person, one vote. That's an easy way to make it super. Yeah, like, so everybody has an equal uh, voice, but then, yeah, the question is, do we want everybody to have an equal voice? Everybody have enough of an informed opinion on different uh, subjects and enough of an expertise to make a weighted claim on something. Mm -hmm. So I think this is like where the balance is between what kind of stuff go to a community vote versus what kind of stuff are decided by people who have that specific role, that specific uh, skill. So like. If something is a technical question, then you're just, it doesn't make any sense to ask 10,000 people who all have an equal say to like vote on what the outcome should be. Like it should be the person who has the best technical background, who is in charge of doing the work to make the decision and move on. Yeah. And what are the ways, what are the tools you're looking at for a metagame for kind of tokenizing or verifying i know with quest chains there can be a lot of skill attribution or accreditation there's also otter badges which feels very similar yeah kind of what are, what are those ways that you're looking at to kind of show or in a decentralized autonomous manner prove that people have the skills or the expertise that they say they do. So there's really no no uh, massively adopted reputation protocol yet. There's a bunch of these tools, like you mentioned, that have this option, but most people, like most profiles, don't have this like record, like this history of contributions or like this reputation, whatever. So, but in Metagame, we have XP. So in Metagame, what we're gonna do, we just have uh, votes, some of the votes based on the, like half of the votes based on, uh, I mean, this is not a past proposal. So this is what I'm going to propose that we do. And so far I suggested it to a bunch of people who all like the idea, but uh, yeah, to move on from this one person, one vote to have a system where the number of your votes, half of it depends on half of total vote, not on your vote specifically, but half of total votes are based on how much XP, so how much reputation somebody has. And the other half is based on the liquidity pool token ownership. Mm. And then the people still need to uh, submit a proposal to become members. So you can just have people 
buy tokens and automatically have more votes, but they would have to buy tokens, take tokens and submit a proposal for, okay, I have these tokens and this is why I want like you to give me votes. So there's also that backstop. Almost like skipping the line in a way of having to work in the DAO and obtain that XP, right? There's all right, there's another avenue where you can use your capital and kind of jump ahead of the line. But keeping it in balance. Keeping skin in the game. Right. I think the, yeah, the important part is keeping it in balance. But yeah, I think we need something like that because otherwise we just can't attract anybody to buy the tokens because like, hey, you want to invest in metagame? And if I want to invest this much, what do I get? Oh, we well, get one person, one vote. <laughs> a great future. A more meta future. Right. Like people who want to invest want some influence over the decision making. And that's why companies have boardrooms. And that's, yeah, like it's been a standard practice in like in the investing world. And people are just not going to invest if you tell them, oh, you can invest a uh, hundred dollars or you can invest $10 million, but you're always going to have the same vote as somebody who has like $1. And there's something to be said about, you know, capital buying influence and you are looking for that balance, right? So you're trying to take the best in what the traditional finance world, how that works. But because as we said at the beginning, right, you guys need that funding to create some more impact. Do you think, though, that you'll start it with 4951 and you'll give since it's early days of the project keeping that 51 percent for the workers and for the xp voters or do you think you'll flip it for the investors or just keep it balanced at 50 50. i want to make it in such a way that it's always 50 50. Mm -hmm. basically the it will be decided like one xp could be one vote or 10 xp could be one vote yeah and then it will be calculated like how many votes are there in total and then this same amount would be distributed across uh, token holders so then like whoever becomes the top the top token holder still can only have like fixed amount because like yeah their total amount of token votes can only be like as much as their total amount of xp votes i wonder if you could ever have that problem though where the 50 percent xp holders and the 50 percent capital holders don't agree on a decision yeah so this this would be the first version and then what i think would be necessary is have like uh maybe 45 percent 45 percent each and then have a 10 percent go to the like advisors yeah like a lex dow or some lawyer third party so the idea is like as you move on the like the guilds that are a part of metagame would also get votes mm. and we have that elders ring which is like the circle for advisors so we can have like 40 percent or like even later we could have maybe 25 percent each so mm -hmm. like 25 percent players 25 percent patrons 25 percent guilds and 25 percent advisors or yeah however however else we want to structure it but yeah the, the first version would be 50 50 and then yeah that's one backstop by making it so that it's like the number of token votes depend on depend on the total number of XP votes, but also you still can't just buy it because mm -hmm. you have to submit a proposal. So you can buy like ten million dollars worth of tokens, but we see that you wrote a proposal and you happen to be from this very shitty VC fund, like mm -hmm. or I don't know whatever yep. the shittiest Silicon Valley. Rock. And we would just say, oh, you know what? You can keep holding those tokens, but fuck yeah. you. Yeah, we're we're not gonna vote on that one, or we're not gonna side with you on that right. vote. Nah. So that's yeah, the like yeah, people like to talk about this permissionless. So it should like that should be permissionless. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. So at some points, sometimes for some things. Right, in yeah. some ways. <laughs> in some ways, but man, does permissionlessness really mean like? It honestly will mean recklessness most of the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, we'll end on this last joke DAO question. Are impact DAOs a left wing movement? It's a good question. I would say yes, but only because, I mean, yeah, because left wing people tend to worry more about impact stuff. They're like more worried about social impact or whatever other sort of impact and problems solving rather than profits. Mm -hmm. And also because DAOs are kind of work around. So I would say they are definitely more left wing than right wing. Mm. I would say that not all impact DAOs are left wing, but any 
left wing DAO is probably an impact DAO. Because they were way too bold. Kind of like the the square and rectangle. Like I know anyone that's doing something left wing oriented, it's probably going to be. I will consider it an impact DAO. But I don't know if I would consider every impact DAO like purely leftist because I would. A lot of the refi stuff can get a little bit hazy, a, a little bit shady with their their capital tokenomics, you know. And oh yeah, yeah, we're totally gonna sequester all of this carbon that we've taken from you, that we've taken your guys's money for. <laughs> Where can people find you? How do they connect to MetaGame? What do you recommend they do? How do they maximize their impact? Out of question, all in one. Can you find me at? Beat, beat, eat, B E T H E T H on Twitter or Telegram. Uh, open my DMs are open. You can find Metagame at MetaFam or at Metagame.wtf. And then you should also consider coming to MetaFest. So that's MetaFest at WTF. And uh, yeah, we are open to all kinds of contributions. If you have some development skills or if you just want to help around the community stuff, whatever else, like we are really open to all kinds of contributions. So that's kind of actually one of the things that we wanted to uh, quote unquote solve with metagame was it, you know, when, like you talk to people who are on the sidelines and they, you, they tend to say, oh, I'm not the developer. So there's nothing for me to do. Like I can't do anything in this crypto space. It's all for developers, but there's actually a shit ton of things and a load of ways to contribute. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to contribute to metagame. And what was the final question? How to maximize the impact? How do the people maximize their impact, man? Staying sane. Staying sane. Always stay sane. <laughs> Take <laughs> care of yourself and stay sane. Maintain sanity. Hold strong. <laughs> Learn. <laughs> Learn more. Keep calm in metagame. <laughs> well, Pete, it was super fun talking to you. I look forward to contributing more and getting more on top of my productivity. I'll try to, uh, maybe I'll join that mochi game that y'all got going with your writing oh, yeah. goals on there. I know I want to get more productive and I'm just always so impressed with how you guys do it at Metagame and how the heck you produce so much, frankly, and how that equals, man, so much summoning power. You're, you're a powerful summoner. Oh man, I really want to focus more on content production, like... I think that's that was working out the best for me and now i'm stuck doing this fundraising shit and i can't wait to get over with it so i can continue producing content we got to produce the content that attracts or summons the person who can do all the vc fundraising and all the pitching <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, well let's work together on producing more of that content i know you're going to be busy with that fundraising but i'll try to get onto live streaming and making some TikToks and youtube videos and this podcast fuck yeah appreciate it man and thank you for having me this was fun yeah brother let's dow this shit man let's dow it all right thank you for listening to another episode of dowing impactful conversations if you're trying to dow shit with me or this podcast you can join our discord if you would like you can find me at tiktok Sometimes I go live on Twitch, so make sure to follow me and turn on notifications for that. If you enjoyed this episode, please like. And if you want to support what I do, I do have a Patreon. You can subscribe on the Discord or with the Me6 bot. And if you're trying to exit to commune with your friends, if you're trying to vibe with your tribe, please reach out to me. I want to help you. I want to connect you with the right people, with the right tools, and get you out of this system. Thank you guys so much for listening. Bye-bye.